All right, well, let's go live. We live. All right, peace and love, everyone. This is Ross Ben coming in with episode eight of From the 40th Parallel. And we got a powerhouse lineup for you today. We got a special guest, the Hood Mystic, who's going to decode the 40th Parallel for us in Moundfield, Ohio, and Michigan, too. Am I right, brethren? We going to stick on the 40th Parallel, straight Columbus today. Straight Columbus. I'm gonna come back. Right. I'm gonna come back for part two, and we are gonna do Michigan. But right now, we we gonna just stick. All right. So, Mystic Columbus, Ohio. If y'all remember when I was in Boulder, and we went to that geodetic marker that we said was really the geodetic zero zero reference point for the planet as far as uh, GPS, digital global positioning technology, right? There was a art installation there that had the 40th parallel projected onto a world map and key cities were identified. The three in the United States were Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Boulder, Colorado, and Columbus, Ohio. So we know Columbus is a very important place in the world grid. And we got the blessing today to be, you know, amongst the hood mystic who's going to decode it for us, you know? But before we jump into that, Mystic Mike, what's been happening? Well, you know what's been happening. We were hanging out. That's what's been happening, but I'm excited to be back in touch. It's been two weeks since we did that tour. I'm super excited that the Hood Mystic is joining us. I did not realize that the third city that was listed on that Boulder installation was Columbus, which makes this for me even more significant. For the people keeping score at home, you should definitely put a double asterisk next to this one. I'm super excited for today. Absolutely. Hey, before we get jumping to, I do have, I got a couple of quick announcements. One, uh, I have gone to press with uh, Knowledge of the Nomo, the Dogon Decoded. So, uh, you know, it's available for order on rossbin.com. And also, uh, the tour that we did in Wissahickon. We got the summer schedule up with Wissahickon Wellness. Mm. So we got four Wissahickon Wellness walks scheduled. Two for June. If I'm remembering correctly, those dates are the 10th and the 24th. And we got two dates lined up for July as well. I just posted a video on my Rossbin 188 site that has some details. And uh, you can register online at wissahickenwellness.com, you know? So I wanted to get that out there real quick. Uh, and if Mike, if you ain't got nothing else to say, we're gonna turn it over to my brethren, the Hood Mystic, who, and let me give him a brief introduction, right? He's a young brethren. Where's your roots, Star? Where you born out of? Where you born out of, Star? I'm born out of Boston, Massachusetts, but oh, wow. I've, my home is Ohio. So I've been all over Ohio for the most of my life, and I'm 36. All right. Yes, uh, young brethren on this mystic path. We linked a couple years ago. And, uh, yeah, man, this man's been intuitively just following his spirit, ancestors awakened inside of him, been freeing his mounds and, and letting minds follow you know so this man's been putting in the work of identifying ancient mounds and then going and and, and awakening them and activating them you know so yeah we in for a treat today and i want to salute the young ones that are stepping up doing these works we definitely want to you know open our platform to ones of this caliber in their youth. So when 
them done manifested their works decade or two from now and everyone's like, wah, we could say, yeah, you know, we saw the hood mystic, you know, yeah, when him was in his, you know, early stages, we, we saw, we knew what it was, you know? So without further ado, brother, come on up and share with us some uh, from the 40th parallel, Columbus Decoded. Hey, man. And let me just say, before I just start, um, <laughs> this is so crazy because, you know, um, Mike don't know this, but Mike is huge in my spiritual development, man. Like, trying to move this thing if I can. There it goes. Mike is huge in my spiritual development because he actually started, well, first off, like me and my wife, we met in Ohio and we, we did our spiritual journey together. And one of the first places that we went to was Moundsville, which is on the 40th parallel. Where Mike comes in is he, like, I, I was listening to the Higher Side chats, of course, where I discovered Ross Ben and Mike. Um, he started talking about Chesapeake Bay and the Susquehanna, and I was just possessed. <laughs> so I just, like, you know, the next time we went um, to Moundsville, we kept going until we re reached um, Chesapeake and Harvard de Grace. And um, we did rituals there, and that was probably the day before Nipsey Hussle had transitioned. So from there, it's just been nonstop spiritual. So like Mike doesn't know this, but he's like my, my like sensei. Like I'm always commenting on his videos and this is just like more than an honor, such as Ross Ben. And so with this presentation that I wanted to do today was combine both of those guys' works. So what we're going to be incorporating is just some basic ideas. If you follow Mike or if you follow Ross Ben, I'm just taking what they've already put in out and just applied it to um, Ohio. So of course there are some things, 40th Parallel, Lancaster, <laughs> Mystic Lancaster, Rosicrucians, Freemasonry, all of the usual suspects, right? <laughs> but, you know, that the influence of Ohio. So um, this is all my personal research and my personal understanding. A quick background between me and Mounds is, um, long story short, I was a chlorine delivery man. I would drive all over Ohio and deliver chlorine to local pools. And, um, just so happened that every little town and village that I went to had these Native American mounds and I never heard about mounds. So long story short, it was a blessing in disguise that I had this job because I was literally getting paid <laughs> a good salary, delivered chlorine, which was pretty easy. But on my lunch breaks in every town that I went to from Marietta to Heath to Newark, to wherever in Ohio there were mounds where I was actually able to do my spiritual work and get paid for it. So to all the people out there that may have a nine to five, there may be an underlying spiritual reason that you're working there. Um, you just have to look. And another thing that I want to say is that I no longer live in Columbus. So once Ross gave me this call and he was like, you know, because I asked about being on the show, because um, I'm I'm bold like that. <laughs> all you can all you gonna do is tell me no. But you know, he invited me on here, and he said, "Okay, me and my family, we hopped in our van and we went to Ohio." Now, the difference between doing this presentation and living in Ohio was that I was able to see the city in a completely different light, right? So, to the people that live in Ohio or the people that just live somewhere. Try to detach yourself from what you got going on and then really kind of look at the city for the spiritual, you know, it's just 
just resonating and just oozing spiritual information, right? But if we're worried about like our nine to five and our mundane lives, we're not even going to see the mysticism that surrounds us. And me personally, I was a victim of that because once I came back to Ohio, it just opened up. So I'm going to go ahead and begin the presentation. But what me and my wife do is we call it mounding. And we go to mounds and we give offerings. We meditate. We drum. We bring the children. We have picnics. And we've been from, let's say, Marietta to St. Louis doing this process. And there's a lot of things that I could talk about that a person can look at and be like, ooh, ah, on the spiritual level. But I would say it all starts in the practice of me going to mounds, okay? Before any spiritual conversation that I ever had, um, I didn't have the verbiage. I didn't have the wits about it. It just wasn't important to me until I just made a practice to going to mounds and opening that gateway within my mind. And once I did that, um, the rest is history. So once again, I just, I don't want it, this conversation to be about me. I want it to be about our observation of these national landmarks. And first thing, first person that I want us to focus in, because we're talking about Columbus, we're talking about Ohio, and there's probably nobody more important to the statehood in the overall um, victory and conquering the Northwest Territory than this man. This is uh, <laughs> Thomas Worthington. I, I don't know why I wanted to say Joseph because I was probably watching a Joseph Budden podcast and our president's name is Joseph, but that's a whole other point. So this is Thomas Worthington. Now, I'm going to give you the full, not the full, but abbreviated history of this man. So Thomas Worthington is an orphan born in Charlestown, Virginia to Robert Worthington. Now the Worthingtons are from Lancashire, England. Now if you follow Michael's content at all, that word should be like ding, 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 Lancashire. You're right. Um, that is um, Lancaster. So he's a part of like he's a part of the family. Now that's an ancient bloodline. So when you think about Francis Bacon and the Rosicrucians, and then you think about how big the country is. Now let's think about before cars, before trains even, right? You got a lot of land to cover. So if I wanted to execute a plan, if I wanted to execute a hostile takeover, then I would need a whole bunch of people that's repping the same thing that I'm repping. So when you reference 50 states, all with the particular history and origin, it probably might seem like these is all different families because they have different last names. But when you really get into the history, at least Ohio's history, it all points back to Lancashire. It all points back to Virginia. It all points back to England and their actual plan. But there are spiritual leaders and like it's people in the front, but then it's people in the back that don't get credit, but they got to get some credit because you can't just get no credit. But once you start paying attention to the people who don't get a lot of credit, but get some credit, you'll start to realize that these probably are the people who had the juice. So Thomas Worthington, he lived in Chillicothe. Long story short, he grew up in Virginia. Um, his parents died early. I'll show you his parents right here. Robert Worthington, his dad died early, right? And then from there, he started to, he was an orphan. And from his orphanage, he um, went to Chillicothe, Ohio. And this was at a time where it was the Northwest Territory. At a certain point, it was a, if you could imagine, people kind of like trading and living off of one another, right? Everybody having a mutual benefit because we're all in the hopes of surviving. The, the 
Ohio wasn't populated a lot at this time. It was documented that it was probably like close to 10 villages, <laughs> 10 settlers or something like that. Very small populated. So Thomas Worthington goes to Chillicothe um, with his wife and a couple more people. And um, they set up shop. First, they set up shop in the lower lands of Chillicothe. But if you've been to Chillicothe, what you'll notice is that is surrounded by mountains. Um, and what, what, what he did was he built his house up on a hill. And that hill, he called it Adina Mansion. Now, Adina are, is the name of the group of people that built mounds in Ohio. They're not the only group, but they're the most prominent group. So you have the Adena Mound Builders, and then you have the Hopewell Mound Builders. For, for some odd reason, he names his mansion Adena. I'm trying to look in books. I don't find no real reason other than he's trying to assume that mantle. Now, I don't want to go too far in my story, but... <laughs> So, Thomas Worthington, this orphan, settles Chillicothe, basically the mayor, because because he's a part of this ancient bloodline. He has a lot of stuff, a lot of money, a lot of resources. Um, he got rid of his slaves, which is a cool thing about him. Um, said he didn't need slaves, and him and his wife were very religious. And if you get into Michael series when they when he's talking about um, settling Lancaster and things of that nature. These people were also religious, but not religious in the way that we look at it now, but in a way that they kind of had power, <laughs> a lot of power. And they were basically rulers of what they could do and what they could provide to everybody else. So imagine Thomas Worthington to be the king of Chillicothe. Now that brings us an important man in this story, Tecumseh. Now, Tecumseh, there's a lot of history about him when you get into books and read about it. But I'm going to try to focus and center in into his meeting with Thomas Worthington, where he established, where Worthington personally established peace with the ancient bloodline of Ohio. Because when you get into Tecumseh, one thing about Tecumseh, although he traveled all over the country, he was born and bred in Ohio. Even more so, there's a live play that takes place every summer from June to July, simply celebrating the energy such as Tecumseh. So if you were to think of Tecumseh, he would literally be the mascot for ancient Ohio and ancient America as a whole. And his death actually was the bridge from the establishment from America being this would be, you know, rusty crunch country into a really established power. Um, what they say is that this is when America finally defeats British Britain once and for all. But at the same time, they're also saying that, you know, they destroyed Tecumseh once and for all, right? Because it is the multiple battles that Tecumseh is being defeated to where these people are now feeling empowered to establish, you know, <laughs> capitals and history. And so I'm just setting the backdrop because I'm going to take you on a tour of mounds in Ohio, but I feel like it's important to understand this history. And I'm paraphrasing a lot because there's a lot of literature and a lot of documents surrounding it, but a lot of this is intuitive. And as you'll see, I'll just use the documents to prove my intuition. So Ultimately, I look at Thomas Worthington as the true father of Ohio because he was the one who had peaceful ties with Tecumseh that allowed this energy to 
really empower him and embolden him on a spiritual level when i'm tuning into these mounds like during this whole process it was more or less of his energy his spirit that wanted me to speak to it and when you reference the history of ohio the fathers of ohio he wouldn't necessarily be mentioned now unless you were able to go to um Worthington, Ohio. Now, Worthington, Ohio is right at the edge of Northern Columbus. And the thing about Columbus is really organized. The streets are dead to right. You know when you're north, you know when you're south, you know when you're east, and you know when you're west. You're not confused about it. Okay? So, at the very tip, the North Star or the Polaris of the city, you have what is called Jeffers Mound, and then you'll also see um, a Freemasonic temple. The thing about Freemasonic temples, and this is just my observation, they're usually cat or catty corner from a historical landmark. They're never generally straight in front of it, but every time that we go to mounds, we'll generally see me and my wife, we continuously make this observation that there's always a Masonic Lodge, a Masonic Lodge slightly off-center. The Masonic Temple is very the northern part of the city of Columbus, and that would be signifying Polaris, the, no, the North Star. And of course, these mounds have specific cosmological representations more than just being lumps of dirt, right? So as we'll see in future slides, these are actual communicative points to stars. Now, my personal example is that I was always somewhat interested in astrology, but following these mounds, they really took my astrology to another level. And I can't even really explain why. But when I get into research, it's like, well, the ancients have traveled these. The mounds were literally set up as cosmological tools. And I find that to be very interesting because they helped me understand astrology. And I didn't even realize that they were supposed to. So. Another part about Columbus is that it is completely aligned perfectly. So the fact of me even getting to this point of studying Columbus is probably because I wasn't from there. If I was from there, I'd probably be Ohio State Buckeye fan or something like that, because the way that the grids are set up is tight, right? If you're from Columbus, you're from Columbus. You're probably a Buckeye fan and you just know everything about everybody and it's like very tight knit. And I find that to be related to how tight the grid system is. Of course, if you follow Ross Ben's work, he would explain how Philadelphia was not as tight and that's why the energy was kind of loose. Well, from Philadelphia to Columbus, the person who plotted out the city, um, Mr. Wright, he knew what he was doing. And so, if you come to Columbus, the center point of the city is Broad and High Street, right? And the interesting thing about High Street is an ancient trail. What I've, another intuitive thing, a side note, but I'll keep going, is that I'm in Detroit now and I love Woodward Avenue. Like, I'm religious about traveling up and down it. My post office is on Woodward Avenue, like a lot of things. But when I do research on Woodward Avenue, I find that it's an ancient trail. And I find that odd is because I'm constantly going up and down, like for no reason other than to visit the river and come back. Like I'm a fisherman and I feel like I'm going to go to the river and fish and take fish back home even though I'm not. But when I go to the river, of course, there's people fishing. <laughs> and, 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 and it's just, it's so weird to me um, how once you get into this mysticism, you can really tap into these ancient grid lines and they exist, but they're kind of layered over by streets. And these streets, if you were to remove that layer, you would get a lot of ancient tradition and ancient history. So Columbus is broad and high street broad is the north and south high street hold on, hold on i didn't say that right broad is the east and west 
I'm going to correct that. And high is the north and south. But the funny thing about high is actually high because it's a ridge. Once again, I would have never put two and two together. <laughs> I always was on high street, but like, why do they call it high street? But <laughs> it's high because it's literally a ridge. And if you were like, I know now, but it literally runs along a, a, a river. So the Scioto and the Olentangy, right? So you have this ancient river cliff. But the interesting thing about this cliff is that from the north to the south, there are mounds. And I'm saying this to the people in Columbus. When you want to, like, you know, tap into the energy, you can go north as far as Jeffers Mounds. There are high bank mounds, right? In the south, there is um, Mound Park, right? And then the east, you have Newark. And all of these places you can get to in less than an hour. And west, you have um, Darby Creek, or you could even go as far west as, um, you can go really far west because the it came from the, um, it can go like, I'm trying to think. Oh, I'm sorry. Miamisburg. Miamisburg Mounds Excuse is me, where you missed. can go. Go ahead. Are you going to share some graphics of these? Yes, yes, yes. All right. I'm just setting the table. I it's going to be all graphics. What's yep. <laughs> yes, yes, I. Yep, it's going to be it's going to be pictures and videos, but just just kind of showing people like if you lived in the city cuz I have a lot of pictures, but I didn't want to kind of show all of them cuz it would have been like it's too many pictures in too many different places. So and I was just saying, you have Broad and High Street and then you have Mound Street, right? And when I came to Columbus, my, my aunt lived on Whitethorn. I lived with my aunt for a couple of years. The first street that I got off on was Mound. So I didn't even know that spirit had a whole play for me. <laughs> and I didn't even realize it. But Mound and High Street is not there anymore but it was once a 40 foot tall mound. And the thing about Ohio, it used to be, it's 10,000 recorded mounds that they've recorded. So imagine how many mounds seriously there were. Um, so the reason that I'm bringing up Columbus and once after this slide is gonna go into more pictures, um, the courthouse, right? The courthouse is the center point of broad and high and that building, is actually built with the dirt and clay from the mounds. So if you're in Ohio and you're like, well, I don't see any mounds on broad and high. Well, the Capitol building is a, a reflection of the literal mounds in the mound building culture. Just walk around there and you'll be really tuned in and tapped in. So I'm gonna show you, this is the, Outside the state house, like Caddy Corner, like in the corner, it's a little placard. And where do I want to show you? Just want to show you one thing. Um, I just wanted to show right here. Um, it says it right in clear day. The the creation of this state house was made from Indian mound clay. Um, the cost is irrelevant because a lot of buildings that built up downtown the reason that they tore down these mounds was because of the clay and the clay was a, a prosperous building materials that if you study the history of Columbus, you'll get into, they're using this mound dirt to build up their society. So they're literally surrounded by mounds and mound energy, whether we know it or not, especially those older bu buildings downtown. And so this is from the court, this is from the courthouse. Um, this is a statue called the, um, These Are My Jewels. And it's taken from a Roman deity, Cornelia, or not even a deity, just a regular girl. And um, her friends came over and they were showing her all of their jewels and diamonds. And then after they asked Cornelia, where are your jewels? And she brought forth her sons. And so this is 
and I have my notes is William Tecumseh Sherman, Salmon Chase. And these are the um, proposed fathers of Ohio, right? Take that off. And then this right here. Got another picture when it will load. Because um, sometimes with information, I notice that it gets a little weird. If you're not, if you're just trying to share information, things get a little glitchy. Okay, this is the video of the, this is the whole courthouse, right? And this is downtown Columbus, brought in high, and that's the statue of William McKinley. I think I'm bringing him to our consciousness and forefront because William Kim McKinley, um, as we know, the curse of Tecumseh, now, the curse of Tecumseh um, actually struck William McKinley, right? And so that's why I'm imagining that they put him in the front of the Capitol courthouse because uh, William Henry Harrison, um, also William Tecumseh Sherman, all of these guys are from Ohio. And so it's this keeping his name alive and his energy alive without actually saying to Kunza. Um, but this is this is also they another another picture that I found interesting because this is big um, Christopher Columbus statue that looks nothing like this in front of the Capitol State House. They took that they tore that one down or took that one down, right? Christopher Columbus, he's supposed to be this negative symbol, but they left this one there. So I was like, well, why did they just take that one down and not take them all down if it was such a negative symbol? So, you know, of course, we're politics and things of that nature, but let's not get confused. Um, this, the whole state was built in honor of Columbus in the capital. Uh, Columbus is literally Columbus for that reason. So <clears throat> back to Worthington. Worthington specifically was the governor who moved um, the capital from Chillicothe to Columbus, right? And I just kind of want to touch on that as I start giving you the pictures and breaking down the journey that we were taking. Uh, along, um, and then tapping into, like, how could I make these connections and things like that. So we're going to start our journey at the Worthington Masonic Museum, which is at the corner of High and 161. And so we're going to, our journey is on 161. We're just going to kind of pull it back out real quick. So if you can see the Worthington Masonic Museum is on the corner of 161 and high, catty corner to that <laughs> is Jeffers Mound, right? Jeffers Mound is in a cul-de-sac in North Columbus and you can just drive up to it. There's no real parking. <laughs> you just have to kind of like park on the side of the street. It's like people, nice homes and things like that. So of course me, like I'm kind of a big guy. So <laughs> I, I was like, what are you doing here? Like, are you trying to break into people's houses? Like never, like I was just to observe the mounds and stuff like that. But it's a real hoity-toity neighborhood. But um, this is, to me, one of the major spiritual centers for Columbus that you probably wouldn't necessarily know about, and especially very ancient, right? And this is a Hopewell Mound, different from the Adena Mounds, because the what I'm about to show you is the Adena Mounds are very, one would say, animalistic, tribal and very like well thought out. The Hopewell mounds are very like old school, but I'm sure that they, that doesn't take away from their power and doesn't take away from their observation. They're just like, like a VHS <laughs> compared to a DVD, right? But still, if I wanted to watch a movie, I'm not gonna complain either way. So we go from North Columbus, uh, Jeffers Mound, and we travel 
all the way down 161. Once again, all of these places from Columbus Center can be reached in less than an hour. First place that we stop is in Granville. Granville is right before Newark, probably take you 45 minutes from Jeffers Mound to get to Granville. And the difference between this mound and Jeffers Mound even though Jeffers Mound is high and it sits over a river, this one is kind of higher and it's elaborate. It's, it's beautiful. Um, can't really get good pictures of it because it's very sunken down. So you got to kind of use your imagination <laughs> a lot of times with these mounds. But this is Alligator Mound. And it's not necessarily an alligator. You can Google Underwater Panther or Mishapishu. And that is the believed to be um sea monster that invades the great lakes and the rivers thereof some people believe it to be fake i'm not that type i know for a fact that that thing is real because i didn't seen it a few times but of course you could argue with me but uh i know that mishu pishu is real i know that the underwater panther is real so this is a mound to to you know give thanks to that energy definitely a place to go to kind of just observe it and then really observe this the scenery because it's like up this is in a cul-de-sac too once again very nice neighborhood <laughs> beautiful neighborhood um and so once again no parking so you just gonna have to pull up to the side of the road and um just observe uh the mound and that's alligator mound but from Granville, you drive probably 15 minutes further down the road to Newark, okay? So <laughs> this is funny because intuitively, I would go to Newark and it was already like a homecoming. I would bring offerings. I would burn herbs. That's where I got the ritual to circle the mound three times and to, you know, wake up the ancestors and let them know that I'm there and, you know, just to say thank you. And one time I did this at Eagle Mound and a, ma a eagle came flying directly into this into the circle. And I was so moved by it because, trust me, I'm normal. It could be a pile of dirt <laughs> for all I know, but I believe that it meant, I, be, I believe that it was more than a pile of dirt. I knew for a fact that it was a spiritual center and seeing that eagle, like the tears, they just couldn't stop because that's like, that was the, that was my confirmation. That's when I knew. And so this is kind of a, a little blurb that I found online in reference to uh, Newark and the Creek Indians who Tecumseh traveled down to Alabama and Georgia and Florida to talk to the Creek Indian leaders and the Rastic leaders and the Seminole leaders. Um, there's document interactions between those people, meaning that the Indians were a worldwide family, whether we knew it or not. And of course, the, the victors get to tell their story. So I'm going to just read this blurb real quick because I thought it was interesting. And this was my whole intuitive process. And I didn't know it, right? <laughs> you would have thought that I would have pulled my intuitive process from reading this, but I just found this a couple of days ago. The Creek Indians of the southeastern United States have a special tradition. They once traveled north on periodic pr pilgrimage to quote unquote special mounds that were important for ritual interactions with the cosmos. We don't know whether those special mounds were in Newark, but the octagon earthworks with its precise alignment to the rising and setting of the moon certainly could have facilitated ritual interactions with the cosmos. So ultimately, we were going to these mounds and doing this road trip um, specifically to to, you know, honor the full moon, which takes place today, right? So, you know, it's all leading up to it and I couldn't be happier. So this is us at the Newark Earthworks. Um, that's my son, Azor. Um, he was my model for that particular photo. He did a good job. Um, and uh, hopefully I can get this picture going. Cause I want to show you guys what it 
specifically looks like. So when you approach the mound, um, it's a big circle, right? And it's like a, a stadium even, right? And then there's like these ditches that go probably, I say from the bottom to the top is probably 20 feet, no lie, right? And these are these ditches that are inside. Now, this couldn't have never been a fort because forts don't work like that. Forts, you would put the moat outside so the soldiers would have to swim, <laughs> right? Then they couldn't swim to get to the top. So this wasn't military. This was spiritual in purpose because you got to imagine walking in there and, you know, that like being surrounded by water. And I imagine it to be religious healers doing specific healings and, you know, people coming together. Like that is literally Mecca, right? For the whole entire indigenous community, right? And we, might, we wouldn't know that because of course, you know, there's a Freemasonic temple on every corner, making sure that their history is being told. So, this is Eagle Mound, the one that I was referencing. Uh, and yeah, it's kind of beaten down, but you can kind of see like the wings on the, it's a wing right there. There go my motto again. Um, so it, you got to kind of look at it over the top. And when you get an aerial view, it just looks like grass. So you got to, once again, go there and then use your imagination. So, of course, to keep it in alignment with the 40th parallel, <laughs> um, new work is on the 40th degree parallel, right? And so from there, we just didn't stop at new work, right? We had to continue our journey. And we continued our journey from new work to Chillicothe. Now, one day I had a delivery from the new work pool to the Chillicothe pool. And I felt like it was a spiritual re like it felt so right. But scientists and, you know, geologists believe that there is an underground tunnel or network from Newark to Chillicothe. Now there is no specific road that can get you from one place to another. You will take some twists and turns and of course, we did that and drove through rural, rural Ohio, which was, you know, albeit interesting. I didn't know that so many people still, you know, are voting for Trump or, you know, are Trump supporters. But that's all we've seen in rural Ohio, Jack. Um, Trump, <laughs> Trump stickers. So the journey thus goes from Newark down here to Chillicothe, a.k.a the land of Tecumseh. So we took 16 to 70 and got back to 23. And 23 will take you down to Chillicothe. Um, the places that we visited there were the Adena State Memorial, um, the Adena, uh, that's where Thomas Worthington stayed. And he has an overlook that you can go to and see where the state seal was created and you can see logan mountain and you just it's, it was a lot of trees there so you can't really see the look overlook now but you can imagine that it had to be fantastic in ancient times like i'm sure he was the talk of all of chillicothe right and then another place that I want to show you guys is Mound City. Now, Mound City is by far the most impressive mound structure that I've been to. And I've been to Cahokia. Cahokia is impressive, but Mound City is just more impressive. I know that's not a word, but sometimes I tend to make up those things. Um, but something about it, something about its small scale, and even though this is a recreation I'm sure the actual Mound City was beyond this, right? So we're just getting a glimpse of it. And I'm an, I'm an amateur, um, <laughs> an amateur drone pilot. I, I got the dollar, $150 drone. Should have got the more expensive ones because it wasn't doing the thing that I wanted to do. But in Mound City, I was able to kind of get some good, good pictures. Um, so... Once again, these mounds are probably can get as high as 20 feet tall and about 300 feet in diameter. Very massive structures. 
And of course, like I said, these are piles of dirt to us now, but the ancestors had a specific cosmological code and a specific diagram that we only know about it that it's real through the formation and the construction of our cities. So you have the physical alchemy where they took the mounds and they built their state houses, but then you also have the spiritual alchemy where they have took the way of life, so to speak, um, with generating energy and having people come to like spiritual sites, right? Even though <laughs> we don't necessarily know the actual original spiritual meaning to it. Uh, so all of these energies contribute to the spirit of Columbus, but only through investigation will you be able to really find it and tap into it this next video should be um oh, it's the same one so so from 23 23 is high street Hi, route 23 eventually turns into high street and you can take route 23 from chillicothe to upper Peninsula, Michigan. I mean, it goes super far. And this is an ancient trail that Native Americans have been traveling, or Native Americans, Aboriginal, have been traveling for m millennia, right? So this Route 23 takes us back to the center of the city, right? Takes us back to the state house. So from Chillicothe to Columbus, um, there is also another mound in Columbus, Strum Mound. I want to show you guys a, my last picture. Okay. This is me getting a little bit better with the drone. Trust me. I just started ever since Ross Ben told me to call. So I'm going to get better with the drone. Just give me a little time. <laughs> but yes, this is in the western part of Columbus on McKinley and fifth, okay? Um, this is right outside the quarry. So this is where I used to, you know, imagine myself to be on doing astrology on YouTube one day. I would be on like a live stream on top of the mound and talking about astrology. Didn't know what I was talking about, but it felt right. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, long story short, man, that is my journey. And that is the trip that I took um, this week um, when Ross Ben had gave me the call. And my overall realization is that I have all of this spiritual energy and information at my fingertips, but I never fully appreciated it. I always was concerned with, you know, just what I was going through in life. But when Rasad gave me that call to do it, I was put in another mind frame to begin to do something outside of my regular life. It was like a mystical calling. It was like an adventure and I was bringing my whole family. And for me, I feel personally tied into Thomas Worthington. I feel personally tied into Tecumseh in a spiritual way. Um, just from doing this, like I wasn't even thinking about Worthington. I wasn't thinking about Tecumseh until I go on this trip. And then I'm just inundated with all of these connections because I was going to let the trip tell a story. And that's the story that it was told to me and I didn't even realize that I was on the 40th parallel till I started doing this research and then it all made sense and um yeah man I can't I just really gotta thank you Ross for this opportunity and just like even on a personal level just going to all of these places and exercising my mystical muscles it really did feel good if if it didn't do anything else you know what I'm saying so yeah, man, that was pretty much it. Wow. Thank you, Hood Mystic. Wow.
I got one question before I forget, man. Go ahead. What is Tecumseh's curse? Okay. Tecumseh's curse is when he transitioned and he so the curse of Tippecanoe is William Henry Harrison. That's his victory. He's called Old Tippecanoe and he gets eventually elected to president. Now, this is the guy that's known to kill or known to not even kill Tecumseh. I'm imagining that it was his brother, his little brother, Texacuanta, or the little prophet. And so because of this, when William Henry Harrison became a president, he lasted as long as to the inauguration, maybe 31 days. And they said, hey, man, it's cold. You need to get in here. You're going to catch pneumonia. He did his speech anyway. And, and Well, no, I think it was the first day, but he ended up dying like 31 days later. So it's been said that every president on the – every 20 years, a president has – you know, died tragically. And one of Ohio's founders, William McKinley, he suffered that curse. You know what I'm saying? So uh, JFK, um, they said it overall stopped um, <laughs> with this recent string, but, you know, the rumors that's been around Biden for this particular time, I wouldn't imagine that it's, it might be a full-fledged if we knew the underwork is what's going on <laughs> with right. the government right now. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it could be a position where they're trying to cover up the curse of Tacombs at this point, if you really wanted to be real about it, because why are all these rumors existing? And, you know, he, it, like he can, there's no indication, you know what I'm saying? But it's like the most popular joke on the internet about that man. And that's weird to me, but right. it would tie specifically into the curse of Tecumseh if you wanted to be honest about it. Huh. And so it would have stopped with Reagan. It would have stopped with Reagan, right? Reagan he, and then... In 80. I will uh, uh, elect inaugurated in 80. Yeah, so I would imagine that it stopped with, it stopped with um, Reagan and then you would figure that it would stop, but it's a lot of weird stuff going on with the government nowadays. So who's to say? Yeah, you got any thoughts, Mike? I've got a whole bunch of thoughts. <laughs> but I've just been sitting back allowing Hood Mister to go do his magic. <laughs> All right, uh, can, can, can I speak for a bit? Always Please. Yes. All right. Well, first off, Hood Mystic, uh, uh, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you for taking the time and, and energy to come and, and share it with all of us. It's greatly appreciated. And I also appreciate the, uh, the kindness which you threw my way in the beginning of your presentation. That definitely did not go unnoticed. But what I want to say, so there are two things which really jumped out at me in watching this presentation. Um, first is obviously the information which you're sharing directly uh, as it relates to the land which we're calling Ohio and understanding um, both in terms of like how it's been manipulated and what that was uh, manipulated. So that, that is fantastic. But what I think is probably the, um, the most significant thing is the inspiration which you, when you told your story, which will hopefully reverberate. Um, how you know you resonated with with like some of mine and Raz's work and then you went you're like well let me go and uncover and do this myself and when when someone like particularly i'm thinking about as it relates to an audience member to to hear that story and be like well hold on i can do the same thing because i think that's what's really occurring it's like as much as us talking about specifics of the land it's this remembering process and this is the sharing it so it's the actual someone going out and doing the work and and then also sharing the information and inspiring other people to do this so all of this kind of like manipulated muck of history we can start to see our way through that so i want to i want to first thing i want to congratulate you and thank you for that um and encourage anyone who's listening that yeah you should do this in your backyard because it ain't columbus is important as we found out from boulder and we can see through history but everything is important and particularly if you're living on the 40th now that 
being said, I want to tell you about my own little um, connection with the Ohio mounds because Ohio is rather significant. Uh, sometime along the lines, I came across this. It's called the Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. And it is a complete set of 48 plates of the original um, surveying that was done of all of the Ohio mounds. Like this, these are dated in the 1800s. And so uh, I'm I found this to be a very good tool for me. I've only been out to Ohio once. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, I definitely recommend like, you know, trying to get your hands on this to go and compare that to what you're seeing, like, you know, with the imagination thing. I thought that was fantastic. These two, for, particularly for anyone who is into the, who wants to research more of the mounds, these two books I found immensely helpful. Uh, one is called the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Native American Mounds and Earthworks. This literally is broken down by state. Do you got a copy of that right there? Is that what you're showing me? This is something different I was going to show. This is like a good resource is like the museums because you might find books there that you won't find yes, online. Yes. So that's where I got this one from, Indian Mounds of the mm -hmm. Middle Ohio Valley. We want to share these resources. What's nice about this, this book and this one too, the Ancient Encyclopedia uh, or the Encyclopedia of the Ancient Giants in North America. This is, this is about mounds as well. And, and, no, and no mound library will go in, will be complete without this one right here, the free your mound and, and your mind will follow. That has definitely has to be completed. But the point I'm trying to make, and I'm still speaking to everyone in terms of like, uh, go out and do the research yourself. These are good, these are good tools to have. And particularly if you travel, as we're coming into the travel season, um, like if you're going to be on the road and you're going to drive to some places, you should have a copy of one of these books and like see where you can stop by. Like that's part of like what you also demonstrated to people was how your life moved out of just the, um, uh, the mundane reality of, of matrix consciousness. And then you're like, hold on, there's a whole nother thing which is all around me and I can literally access it uh, in a very real material way. And when I do that, I have real changes. Like I understand the heavens with a greater degree of clarity I had before. I understand my landscape more. I understand myself more. I understand the, the, my, my ancestors more. And so you're living proof of that. And so again, like I, if there's one thing which anyone really gets out of this, it would be it would be that is what I would hope is like go out and, you know, don't just watch, go and do go and do. Um, and uh, one last thing, which um, I, I wanted to point out was uh, what I thought was kind of interesting. This is the way how I understand it is when you're talking about that kind of catty corner, that Masonic lodge location at these key locations. Um, so the, uh, the, the in conjunction, like the 150 degree angle, you know what I'm talking about in astrology? So that's also known as the Machiavelli whisper. Mm. All right. So imagine this. Mm. Imagine you're a person of great power. No, just, oh, I guess we're all people of great power. Imagine you're standing there. You're looking out into the life in front of you. And then someone comes and steps up behind you. They're standing right behind your left shoulder. Maybe they're standing behind your right shoulder. And they're not coming right at you. They're not coming directly behind you. They're coming into that kind of weird angle. And they've got your ear in a really, really strange place. It's like, it's intimate, but it's, a, it's an unusual intimacy. And when someone has that whisper, there's a certain level of influence. You can't see them because you're hearing them from behind you. But there's a kind of like a surrender. There's, that, is the, that is the angle. So I'm describing it in a human term, but it's like the archetype of that angle of influence is that it's a very, very important angle. Like if you've ever approached someone and you have their ear like that, that comes with a great degree of responsibility. Uh, and if you, <laughs> if you receive that, you know, you know you're vulnerable. But, that, but if you earn that trust, that's a very significant, that's a very significant um, uh, place to be. And so I, I, I guess maybe that's the last thing I want to say, and maybe I'm going to hand it back to you because I want to hear what your thoughts are, is this 
tying together, there was, there's a trust. There has been a trust which has been um, seemingly uh, um, uh, lost as it relates to some of the folks who came that were here in like the 17 and 1800s and the people that were here before them. Um, what's your thought is that uh, in terms of like restoring or even that as a story? Like, what is your opinion as it relates to that? Mm -hmm. Like, what comes to mind is like a rich guy who has children who didn't have to do the work that the thing about Thomas Worthington, his parents were rich, but they died early. So he he could adopt his father. So he adopted a military man and a military man in my mind would be somebody who gives you that adversity, right? That makes you tough. He even like went on his own one time and went down to the Virgin Islands and got swindled out of his money immediately and then had to kind of go back and find his way home, restore himself, restore his energy, and then head back out to Ohio. And like from that experience, he built character. Now, I'm imagining that the generation of Jefferson and all of these guys were like, get it out the mud. And their children were recipients of that and created, and created a, like a who cares, like atmosphere or attitude towards that. And as far as like that Machiavellian whisper, I always feel like I used to feel crazy about it but now it's more of a comforting feeling being watched right because generally i'm in ohio now the thing about ohio is notorious for being a sundown town i, I feel so safe when i'm in ohio i feel so welcome <laughs> so loved right and so that machiavellian whisper I don't view Masonic or Rosicrucian mythology to be bad. I think that it has a purpose, but that generation that came under it quite naturally was spoiled brats and, you know, disintegrated. And like any child, I think, like my children, they don't share the same ilk as me because, you know, I'm providing this particular life that allows them to be that spoiled energy and i kind of see it from both sides do i want my child to be tough yeah or do i want my child to like be spoiled because of what i've been through so i'm trying to as a dad right find that balance and i think that that generation probably to a certain degree more to a certain degree less but i feel like from the colonial generation and the post-colonial generation is completely disconnected from, I imagine like having to, like this is what I think about when I think about the formation of this country. It's gonna be some hard ass work to take over this whole joint. <laughs> like we're going to have to like, and so when I look at it and I see these governors and I see these senators and I see these generations, Right. And from there, after Manifest Destiny, it's just like, let's enjoy this. And so where we're at now. Wow. Hey, I, I did have one other question. Well, I had a couple other questions, actually. It's not directly related to your what you shared today, but it's just questions I had about Ohio. One is the Society of the Cincinnati. And uh Cincinnati, Ohio, having their mascot being the Bengal Tigers, like the uh, Cincinnati Bengals, <clears throat> and the t and and it's the so the Cincinnati Bengals. The reason why the tiger is their symbol is connected to Chief Tammany, where the Tamanin Society, which is the name the Society of the Cincinnati adopted, right? So it was like in colonial times, they were the Society of the Cincinnati. Then <clears throat> after Chief Tammany was named the patron saint of the United States, the Society of Cincinnati adopted the name, the Tamanin Society. And they became such a political beast, particularly in New York, right? They were 
referenced in journalism as the Tammany Tigers, right? So Cincinnati seems to have all of these symbolic ties to the society of the Cincinnati. And are you aware of any of that organization's work in Ohio? Are you on mute? He's on mute. All right. From what I read in your book, I have that um, I have that base. But then doing my own individual investigation, um, like it's the city of Seven Hills, right? That's Cincinnati. Yeah. Cincinnati is the city of Seven Hills. Yeah. Well, Rome, right? Seven Hills. So I view Cincinnati as being Rome, and then that Cincinnati mythology of the retired war general, war leader who was on his farm, living his life, and then, hey, we have a war, we need you, and then him shirking that responsibility and leading them on to war, and then going back to regular society. I view that mythology as a symbol for, like, the brotherhood, like I'm there if you need me, <laughs> but mm. ultimately I'm not going to put it out in the forefront. And I really think like, if like when you go to like Cincinnati, like the museum, you're going to get ancient relics from all over the planet. Like that's a landmark, you know? Um, why is that? You know? And then just like, the university, everything about Cincinnati is mystical. It's an Eden Park and mystical. Um, Eden Park and mystical. Eden Park in Cincinnati. Um, mounds. Fort Ancient, right, is a very mystical mound 20 miles outside of Cincinnati. So the Cincinnatis, I don't feel like they'll be put out in the forefront because I feel like they're just holding it down from my personal <laughs> observation, just tying in the mythology and everything. But it's a lot of mounds in Cincinnati, all my people in Cincinnati. Like, like this book, it's probably 20 good mounds that you could visit in the surrounding Miami area. I mean, surrounding Cincinnati, but the Miami River, <laughs> Miami tribe. So still same thing. And, uh, I heard that there is a Philadelphia, Ohio. A That's new Philadelphia. New Philadelphia. And I heard one of the last Lenape massacres occurred there. Are you familiar with any, any history with that site? Um, new Philly, not so much. Um, that's Northeast, Eastern Ohio. And the thing about Northeastern Ohio, commercial, like, even though there may be mounds, it's like more of Pennsylvania, where there's not very much acknowledgement to the mounds. When you get like into central, because I grew up in Northeast Ohio, so didn't really see mounds or could get a reference. But when I moved to Columbus, when I moved down to that 40th parallel, um, that's where all the action was. But that's also you got to know what you're looking for because it's like I didn't feel good about moving to Columbus when I first moved there because I didn't realize that I was on a spiritual journey. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily know in that second question. So in traveling to Ohio, like traveling through Ohio, delivering this, um, delivering this quarry, there is a city called Wyandotte, Ohio, right? And this was like far out from the drive. This is like almost, this is West, right? So this is like far, far out. And there's like this pool. And it was something about this pool. It was something about this state in the city. It's a street called um, Blackfoot Street. But long story short, I just couldn't, I would deliver there, man, and I would be mad, Ross. I would be just angry. And I said, it's got to be a reason I'm so angry when I come here. Right. And that was, you know, the site of the Wyandotte massacre. Um, and that was the last stronghold of like, like that was that was like Custer last stand, you know, for the east. Like we had got pushed so far in into Northwest Territory that that Wyandotte, that 33, that like Miami um, 
And when you get into the history of Ohio, it's basically them to be to be blunt, it's them killing Indians. Like that's like it's blood in the soil. Like rural Ohio, Southwest, East, that's all them coming over. Like once you start to real like do the research, and I wish I could uh, um reference that if I like but Type in Wyandotte, Ohio, and then the massacre. And yeah, it's a very, that's a very close, that's like, that's one of my most, like, that's that job to me. I did a lot of stops, but I'm telling you that Wyandotte, um, that is something that is just imprinted on my heart. You know, just the, I, you know, honestly, I feel like I was there. I mean, I know I was there. Let me stop. You know what I'm saying? I know I was there. I know that that was one of the places that I, transition to i could just feel that you know what i'm saying and and yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling it now but it's, it feels good now because i can see it from the different angles and so yeah man all right and i got one last question mm -hmm. what's the symbology of the cleveland browns who are mm. the browns the browns man so you know <laughs> It's it's funny, right? Because when you get into history, this racialized history of the um, <laughs> the the states, right? You can Google this. You know, they they always talk about the red man, the white man, the yellow man, the black man, but you never hear about the brown man specifically, right? Until you come to Cleveland. Now, Cleveland, of course, is one of those major. So Cleveland is part of the Big Dipper, Ursa Major, right? So you have um, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia. It's like the Seven Sisters, and they kind of make that. Well, Cleveland is one of them, um, sitting right on Lake Erie. And um, you're talking about the Cleveland Browns, but you're also talking about the Cleveland Indians, correct? <laughs> right. So the Cleveland Brown Indians. Right, because that's the baseball <laughs> team, right? Yep, that's the baseball team, right? But it's like, you know, these types of conversations are taboo, right? Because at the same time, they said, you know, the Washington Redskins, they can't exist. But the Cleveland Brown and the Cleveland Indians, you know, <laughs> they're still, they're not the Cleveland baseball team. So, like, growing up in Ohio, Ohio is extremely tribal extremely like you know i've moved in many different cities in ohio um i don't feel like i'm at home until i'm in ohio and once i'm in ohio i feel instantly comfortable and at home and my parents my mom even though i was born in boston my mom and my grandmother grandfather they were all born and bred in Ohio. And when I asked my grandmother, you know, about our history, she specifically says that we're Cherokee Indians. Now, I know that everybody has the right to their own personal history. So from my mom's side and my dad's side, both being from Ohio, um, it's clear to me when they reference the Brown Indians, it's a forgotten history that you know, people don't necessarily want to talk about because it's so racialized and it's so classified. Um, red people, black people, you know, brown people and these types of things where we know like that don't really exist. But if you wanted to be correct about it, it's like a nod. Right. And then you have like Jim Brown. Right. And <laughs> you can you can start doing the history on Jim Brown, you know, and you'll come to the same conclusion. Right. Uh, so. <laughs> It's, played, it's, it's a clear thing to Jim Brown who played for the Cleveland Browns and look played for the Cleveland profile looks real indigenous American Aboriginal Aborigines. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But he was, it's a, he was a, a excellent player though. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, so you talking about he's high Aborigine. level physique, you know, like when you study, uh, yes, man, he's, you know, he's a humanitarian, he, you know. He has spoken up. He's like the old school athlete that, you know, mm -hmm. gonna hold yeah, he's the in the air at the Olympics or Muhammad Ali, like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to speak out against this war. He He's from that cloth. Yes. Cut from that fabric. Yes. 
Mr. Wonderful, the overall quintessential archetypal male, you know, and, you know, that's something that, you know, Indians or we don't really think about them in that way unless we start to look at people like Scottie Pippen and, you know, it's like, you could go on and on. Um, Isaiah Thomas, you know. You could, say, you could say on levels that's like the uh, noble savage. Yes. Like the archetype of uh, Chief Taminen. And yes. it, it did sound like Tecumseh is a echo of Tamin Taminen. And mm -hmm. Worthington was an echo of William Penn. Mm -hmm. Yes. In that regard, you know? Yes, yes, yes. And how they, that was very important to the overall success of this country, to rock the baby to sleep, right? That was very important because if the baby wasn't rocked to sleep, you don't stand a chance because there's always going to be more Indians than there are settlers, mm -hmm. right? So what's the most important part to their success? The translators, the people who've established treaties and had good relationships, standing relationships with the tribe. Because if I can establish a standing relationship with a tribe, then I could then set up my intel. I could set up my full plan. I could actualize and take over it. If I'm trying to fight a war, you know, trying to fight Indians every day, then I can't really accomplish too much of anything. It's too much war. So I look at Worthington and William Penn as the true, <laughs> you know, Thomas Jefferson and, and Andrew Jackson, they're going to get the credit. But you start to look at um, the Plymouth Indians, uh, you know, all of these relationships that they built was actually the foundation. And they didn't even just, they learned <laughs> to build civilization, how to tap into energy. And so part of this story, I think, is from tapping into the mounds, it wasn't as if they were, they knew that they were going to have this success, but they actually honored and tapped into these mounds and gained that success. Thomas Jefferson, right? <laughs> He's not a great man by accident. One could reason that it was because they were tuned in and tapped into this energy that the Indians said, okay, we're not the creators of it. We're the benefactors of it. And if you're going to be here, you're going to take over this land. You're going to have to benefit from this too. This is going to make you strong. This is going to make you wise. This is going to make you prepared. I know for a fact that that's was the overall relationship and the overall success of the planet. But to the individual, if you want to be, I feel like you can incorporate the mounds into your overall spiritual diet for those same things that these people benefited from or experienced thereafter. So if I'm overstanding correctly, Tecumseh's curse, Tecumseh was working with Worthington and then at some point felt betrayed and then put a curse on subsequent presidents from McKinley onward, and then every 20 years up to Reagan, the presidents suffered Tecumseh's curse. Yes, yes, and the government specifically, meaning that there is a spiritual component to this land, um, the movie. Um, ooh, I gotta think of, but yeah. It's like horror stories in general. Where does horror come from? Is the fact that we are walking on ancient burial grounds. You're talking about ghosts and people returning from the dead. Well, this country is the archetypical, you know, protagonist in a horror movie, right? <laughs> Against yeah, the that was that like if you take Stephen King's mind to yes. represent the European mind, right? Yes. The, col the colonial American mind. You find yes. uh, what they call, like the magical Negro is an archetype yes. you find in Stephen oh. King, as well as like some power, an ancient Native yes. American mound or Amer uh, Native American a uh, cemetery or burial ground has, like whether it's resurrecting uh, life, like in Pet Cemetery, or The Shining, yep. you know, all of that was occurring on mounds. So that's very interesting, you know? 
You there? Yeah, our, our, our technology is glitching. So, and Mike, you, you got anything you want to seal up, man? I got a couple questions for you because you piqued my interest. Was uh, when the Hood Mystic Ant, when he told the story of, of the um, massacre site where he was feeling, where it, it created a, a, a contemporary feeling of anger and like inner turmoil. Was that what you're talking about in terms of the, uh, the last massacre of the Lenape or was that something else? I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> Because it's my understanding it occurred in what's called New Philadelphia, Ohio. Okay. Uh, so yeah. I'm not sure if that's near yeah. Y and It's a curse to some, but it might. <laughs> I'm not certain what just happened. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, brother. Go ahead, what you were saying. I wasn't saying anything. I was just listening. Could y'all repeat? Because I was glitching out, and now I'm back. So y'all were talking about something very interesting in reference to the anger. I just wanted to hear Mike's point one more time, if you don't mind. Oh, I, I was – when you told us the story of the – of the um, – of that one location, I forget the – I forgot what it was what, – what you named why, it. But why in that? Why yes, I just remember the dot. I'm picturing in my mind a Y and an ampersand and dot. That's like how. <laughs> but anyway, so when you're Y and dot, you're saying like whenever you were there, you felt anger. You felt like, you know, maybe not even like it was your anger, but you're picking something up. And like there was a tying into like that being the same location of the, the massacre. And you said, you know, you think you were there. Like you felt you feel a connection that deeply. My question to Roz was, is that the same location which he which he was asking about i was i was unclear to that if that if that is the same place where the um where the lenape had their final massacre and he said all all ross said he knew was that it supposedly took place in new new philadelphia which i think is where wyandotte is is wyandotte new and new in philadelphia they one and the same you're mute they're not. They're in two different parts of the state. So, they're not, so it's not the same place. Mm -mm. But when you talk about places such as like New Philadelphia and Canton, there's a lot of history on Indian massacres. Like there are a lot of them. So it probably wasn't the same one. And I was just referencing an right. experience because when you reference the general Ohio public, like it's some happy people, but. <laughs> you get in some very angry energy and you might not yeah. understand where it's coming from yeah, if you've I, been uh, here. <laughs> my, my experience working with Ohio in a lot of different ways is just that. Uh, um, in a lot of parts in the Midwest, to be quite honest, is there's, a, there's an underlying, but particularly Ohio in a different way. And I'm just saying this based upon my own experience working with people from Ohio and then also, you know, been through that. There, it, there does seem to be a different type of underlying anger or, or something which is beneath the surface and is unsettled. And I think you did, um, it was a really uh, powerful way of, of visualizing or that linkage of what you did was how sacred Ohio is, like as identifiable by all of the mounds uh, as a land and a, a location of history, but then also it being um, a land of a lot of bloodshed. Um, there's a little bit of that in Pennsylvania, but not to the extent. I mean, it's making me, listening to your story uh, makes me want to go and relook at at Gettysburg, like what happened, what does that landscape look like? Because we know what happened there. And then also Antietam, Antietam in Maryland, which is the other big uh, bloody civil war place. And to like kind of look at those as indications of bloodshed on sacred sites. Definitely rituals to like blood sacrifices and kind of feeding the land and cementing a lot of it. So I imagine like how when they talk about wars and stuff previously, they were free to do psyops and things of that nature more easily because it wasn't like people online debunking things. So, you know, of course, it may look like a war between two warring factions, but generally it could be 
even though the two sides really feel like they're at war with each other, I'm sure the puppet ma masters are saying, we need you guys to fight at Gettysburg, spill this blood so we can further our endeavors with the land. That's how I view it, you know, um, especially St. Clair. Um, these are just major battles in Ohio, you know, St. Clair, Wyandotte, um, New Philadelphia. These are Cincinnati. <laughs> um, you know, it goes on and on and on like the torment, you know, they talk about the KKK down south. Right. Um, but they don't never talk about, you know, the northern version forget what they were called like the black something right the black skulls somebody some scary name right they were the offshoot of the clan but much more violent you know and so these imprints and these things even though nobody in ohio is talking about it like <laughs> we experience it we're all clustered in and like canton cleveland and all of these places but when you look at ohio it's so expansive meaning that if i never had that job at OP Aquatics delivering chlorine, I would have never knew about a mound. Even living in Columbus, I had to get out of Columbus and then come back to say, oh, are there any co mounds in Columbus? It's not common knowledge. So, mm -hmm. nor is the battles, you know. So it's just like, we just woke up one day, you know, and just kind of been here ever since. But doing the history, you get to figure out where all of this came from and working through it through mysticism, like, Real quick, um, this journey taught me that, you know, in fact, I am a spiritual being. So when I get into these sites, I just let go of my body and tune into this spiritual side of me, not just because I'm in the house and I'm wanting to, but because I'm aligned with this grid. And so for anybody listening, um, if you're struggling with it, you know, these sites are there to assist you, but you wouldn't necessarily know it until you go there. They, they've assisted me tremendously in my spiritual growth and development, personally. Hey, and on that note, Hood Mystic, leave your contact so people, and, and tell them the services you provide and leave your link. Sure, sure. So right now, I just finished a book um, called Chakra Nova. I'm really focused in on that. It's um, attuning your chakras to the glands of the body so just you know dealing with the glands and the endocrine system is very technical but it's very simple um getting a lot of good reviews been working on that um my website colombian so that's colombian and x like the the letter x colombian exchange right and the, the interesting reason why i named my company the colombian exchange group i didn't know this but um i was fascinated with the import export between this continent and the western world the the one of the forebearers are the treasures of the mounds right that kind of started the colombian exchange so that's another connection that i haven't realized but colombian exchange group um all of my books are on there. I got three books now, Astrology Explained, How to Read NATO Charts, and Chakra Nova. Um, I have done readings in the past, and I still do readings in the past, but this year, I'm really stepping into becoming an author. I find that it's easier for me to help people by working on myself instead of like helping other people all the time um, because I need help <laughs> too. So through my literature, I try to reach people, um, but you know, I'm always on YouTube. So Google me on YouTube or search for me on YouTube, subscribe to me, um, hood mystic at Gmail. If you want to, um, talk to me, um, I answer all emails. So that's the easiest way to contact me guys. Awesome. Awesome. Mike, you got any closing words? Uh, I was so tempted I mean, to go down. Uh, I did a little bit of research the last week, like spontaneous. I wasn't planning on it on Muncie, Indiana. And I'm going to bring that up maybe next time. And I kind of like what we're doing, Ross, about maybe bring, talking about to people who are other places on the 40 parallel. But I'm going to save that for next time. I think that's going to be kind of interesting. And it ties into Hood Mystics work and beginning to understand all the mystics who are in the Midwest 
uh, between here and Colorado and Boulder. And like, that's being recognized. So I just want to say like, if you're in that area, like uh, now it seems to be your time to shine on the 40th parallel in the Midwest. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Hood Mystic, thank you so much. Uh, Chakra Nova, that's kind of like a sexy title. I want to go check out and see what that's all about. I'm thinking uh, uh, <laughs> Casanova. I'm sure yeah. that play is right in there. I'm sure that's it's funny. Be... It's funny because at the end of that book, there are 11 um, little things that me and my wife work together on, like mystic sexual techniques. I figure, like, once you align your chakras, you're like, what am I going to do? You know, you make love. So, you know, Casanova, Chakra Nova, I didn't put that connection together till just now. So. If, you, if that does not sell 15 more books, I don't know what will. We got the Chakra Nova right here with us. Roz, it's always a pleasure. I don't have anything else to say. And let me hand it back to you for closing words. Thank you, Roz. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Well, I was just going to say, they might actually get a double dose uh, come the new moon because I was hoping we were going to video some highlight footage of the next Wissahickon wellness walk, which I think is going to line up to be around that next uh, new moon. So we might have to come on and chop it up a little bit, let you share your vision on the Muncie and, uh, you know, as well as share a little bit of the Wissahickon Wellness Walk that's lined up for June. So I'm going to leave it on that note and uh, just say, yeah, give thanks for us all coming together. This is a great way to bring in this full moon energy. And uh, from one mystic to another, salute. Yes. Thank you, guys. Yes, sir. All right, so uh, give All right. 